Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Ashwin Mehta, and I'm the Medical Director for Integrative Medicine in Memorial Healthcare System, Broward County, Florida, USA. And I'm very happy to be with you all, having been invited by eCancer to share a subject that is very near and dear to my heart. Really, it's about empowering patients to live beyond cancer with the, the latest science in nutrition, exercise, mindfulness meditation, good sleep practices, and using all manner of lifestyle and behavioral methods of improving quality of life throughout the continuum of cancer care. My talk is entitled Integrative Oncology, Evidence-Based Supportive Care for Patients During Treatment and Survivorship. So my, my goals with you are going to be to define integrative medicine. What is it that we're referring to when we talk about integrative medicine and how is it different from alternative medicine? We're gonna be talking about the role of integrative medicine in cancer care as well as in survivorship. And we're gonna present the evidence for nutrition, physical exercise, quality sleep, acupuncture, mindfulness, and other lifestyle and behavioral methods of improving quality of life throughout the spectrum of cancer care. So what we found is that there's a, there's a lot of people, uh, there's, a, there's a wide prevalence of individuals who are using modalities that are considered outside of mainstream medicine in order to help them cope with cancer treatments and strengthen immune system and reduce inflammation uh, and as well as mitigate symptoms. So in the United States, nearly 40% of people are using approaches that are outside traditional mainstream Western conventional medicine for specific conditions or overall well being. So, likewise, hospitals have begun to implement integrative modalities into their care design. According to a recent survey, 42% of the 714 hospitals surveyed had modalities consistent with an integrative approach which was a significant increase from just five years earlier when 27% of hospitals offered such treatments. So how is integrative medicine different from complementary and alternative medicine? So we've seen these terms, but how are they different and what do they mean? Well, complementary approach generally refers to using a non-mainstream approach together with conventional medicine. Alternative refers to using a non-mainstream approach in place of, in substitution for conventional medicine. And just a very important point, we do not advocate the use of alternative medicine. We are very much a complementary medicine model. So unfortunately, some patients gravitate to the use of widely promoted, disproved or unproven alternative methods to achieve their goals. So it's very important to remember that no less than mainstream cancer therapies in common use, complementary therapies must be evidence-based or lacking firm evidence must have a rational basis. So this scientific integrity is incredibly important in our practice because that's how we have won the faith and trust of referring oncologists, surgeons, radiation oncologists, and we work shoulder to shoulder with them in order to provide optimal supportive care as patients go through standard treatments. Integrative medicine has increasingly replaced the moniker of complementary alternative medicine as the preferred term. Integrative oncology is a synthesis of mainstream treatment and complementary therapies in cancer care. Our goal is to provide non-invasive, non-pharmacologic adjuncts to mainstream treatments that improve patient strength and control, the physical and emotional symptoms associated with cancer and cancer treatment. Our goal is to provide patients with a sense of control and self-empowerment at a time when many feel vulnerable and life seems out of control. There was a wonderful study done at MD Anderson that looked at complementary and alternative medicine usage in minority and medically underserved oncology patients. And what this study found was that a high number of patients reported awareness and use of complementary therapies. It was the highest 
using prayer, 85%, relaxation techniques, 54%, dietary interventions, 29%, meditation, 19%, and massage, 18%. Patients' interest in using complementary techniques was high for nearly all therapies, and lack of adequate knowledge and cost were, of use were reported as deterrents to use. What's interesting is that so many patients feel reluctant to disclose what they have been doing on their own to improve their health, and they're reluctant to disclose these modalities to their doctors. Why is this the case? So in this particular study, nearly 4,510 U.S. adults reported non-disclosure within seven areas of medically relevant information. Between 61 and 80% reported not disclosing medically relevant in information and disagreeing with physicians' recommendation was one of the most important reasons cited for non-disclosure. Another was misunderstanding physicians' instructions. Most common reasons for non-disclosure included not wanting to be judged, not wanting to hear how unhealthy their behaviors are, embarrassment, or not wanting the physician to feel that they're a difficult patient. So what's very, what this study shows is that as physicians, we need to be doing a better job of asking the questions, not just what medications you're taking, but also what other things are you doing beyond prescription medications in order to improve your quality of life and overall health? What vitamins are you taking? What supplements are you taking? What herbs are you using? Are you drinking any type of tea? Have you made any nu nutritional changes in your life? What is your degree of physical activity? How well are you sleeping? These are questions that increasingly physicians, oncologists, and integrative practitioners are asking with greater frequency in our medical practice in order to guide our patients better. What types of things can they be doing in order to improve their quality of life? And also to share what is in the science, what kinds of things are supported by good evidence, and what kinds of things are really not the greatest use of their time or energy, resources, and even money. So this is very important that we stick to the science. What is integrative medicine? It's very much a patient-centered approach. It's a partnership between patient and practitioner. We span the spectrum from prevention to treatment. We prefer to use natural, effective, non-invasive interventions whenever there's good evidence to support their use. And we also use non-conventional as well as conventional modalities. We engage mind, body, spirit, and community. We encourage our providers to model healthy lifestyles and behaviors for our patients. We focus on lifestyle choices for prevention and maintenance of health. And we maintain that healing is always possible, even when cure may not be. So we know that different lifestyles impact our cancer prognosis. This was a study that looked at post-diagnosis lifestyle factors in association with late estrogen receptor positive breast cancer prognosis. It looked at association of lifestyle factors with late recurrence and all-cause mortality among 6,295 patients, five years ERPR positive, stage one to three breast cancer in the survivorship population. And the endpoints included weight gain of greater than 10%, a body mass index of greater than 35, alcohol intake, physical activity, and smoking. And what this study shows us is this most certainly modifiable lifestyle factors are associated with late outcomes among long-term estrogen receptor positive breast cancer survivors. So these are very important to take it into account. These are some of the negative behaviors that impact prognosis adversely. Well, the Journal of Clinical Oncology has published this wonderful special article that looks at how integrative therapies during and after breast cancer treatment can be used in an evidence-based way. These clinical practice guidelines are being developed by the Society for Integrative Oncology, 
which is a wonderful organization that is partnering with ASCO in order to make this very valuable information available. And what they've found is that, the, that meditation, yoga, and relaxation with imagery are recommended for routine use among com for common conditions, including anxiety and mood changes in the context of cancer treatment and in survivorship. What they've also found was that stress management, yoga, massage, music therapy, and meditation are recommended for stress reduction, anxiety, depression, fatigue, and to improve quality of life. This body of evidence received a grade B. The majority of interventions and modalities did not have sufficient evidence to form specific recommendations. Notably, one intervention, acetyl-L-carnitine, for the prevention of taxane-induced neuropathy was identified as likely harmful because it was found to worsen neuropathy. So this is very important. Sometimes the vitamins, supplements, and herbs that patients are taking are actually working against standard treatments and, and actually worsening outcomes instead of improving overall health and quality of life. So one thing that is pretty universally encouraged and recommended, both supported in the literature as well as used clinically, and that is exercise. Every patient who comes to our integrative medicine consultation receives an exercise recommendation. This is very important. And the evidence draws from research such as this. This was a project that looked at the effects of a physical activity behavior change intervention on inflammation and related health outcomes in breast cancer survivors. This was a pilot randomized trial done in Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. What this research concluded was that chronic exercise training actually reduces inflammation in the body and it actually improves fatigue and sleep quality ultimately resulting in a reduced risk of breast cancer recurrence. There, what we find in our clinic is that there are many interrelated constellation of symptoms. This includes fatigue, weight loss or weight gain, poor sleep quality, depression, anxiety, neuropathy, cognitive changes, physical discomfort, physical deconditioning, sexual dysfunction, and lymphedema. So oftentimes we describe these as a constellation of symptoms because they're many times they're interrelated, they're interconnected. And because they're so interconnected, it behooves us to use a more integrative approach. Our integrative approach includes nutritional recommendations and exercise prescription, mindfulness and relaxation techniques, good sleep hygiene, acupuncture, therapeutic massage, and yoga practices in order to improve quality of life. So from a nutritional standpoint, the AICR recommends being as lean as possible without being underweight and being physically active for at least 30 minutes every day. Also, from a nutritional standpoint, we've, they've found that a low-fat dietary pattern and long-term breast cancer incidence and mortality. This is from the Women's Health Initiative Randomized Clinical Trial presented at ASCO in June, 2019. This concluded that adoption of a low-fat dietary pattern associated with increased vegetable, fruit, and grain intake, demonstrably achievable by many, significantly reduced the risk of death from breast cancer in postmenopausal women. This, this study actually provides the first randomized clinical trial evidence that a dietary change can reduce a postmenopausal woman's risk of dying from breast cancer. So it's very important, these types of nutritional recommendations. We, we offer a host of nutritional risk reduction strategies, including increasing our intake of cruciferous vegetables. This includes broccoli, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, so these cruciferous vegetables are high in a compound known as indole-3-carbonyl, which is very healthy. It's a wonderful, wonderfully powerful antioxidant. Also, the study of Asian mushrooms is increasing. These are Asian mushrooms like maitake, shiitake, reishi mushrooms. 
there's a compound in some of these mushrooms called AHCC, also known as active hexose correlated compound, which has been studied to reduce the viral burden from HPV positive head and neck cancers, as well as cervical cancers. Turmeric and ginger containing wonderful curcuminoids. These are powerful antioxidants that can be used. Uh, and we don't recommend the supplementation with these. We recommend actually eating the original foods, the cruciferous vegetables, the Asian mushrooms, uh, eat, introducing turmeric and ginger in foods, drinking green tea, and also we're very aggressive about replenishing vitamin D in our clinic because vitamin D deficiency has been shown to be a risk factor for many different types of cancers. So there's certainly a benefit of a plant-based nutritional approach. And I'll share with you the, the, the results of a double-blind placebo-controlled randomized trial evaluating the, the effect of a polyphenol-rich whole food supplement on prostate-specific antigen progression in men with prostate cancer. It's a very important landmark study done by Robert Thomas, my colleague and friend in the UK. And what was this polyphenol-rich supplement? It was effectively a combination of pomegranate, green tea, broccoli, and turmeric. So what's nice to note about this study is that they took the most antioxidant-rich fruit, pomegranate, leaf, green tea, flower, the cruciferous vegetable, broccoli, and root, turmeric, and combined them in a formulation to improve overall survival in men with prostate cancer. So this was a very nice study. And so our recommendation is essentially to eat more roots, fruits, leaves, and flowers. Also the microbiome, wonderful research that has been shown that the microbiome is related, it does not only occur in our digestive tract, but there is the microbiome of breast tissue as well. So the microbiome, the bacteria that is, that is inside our bodies actually can either enhance the impact of our, enhance the functioning of our immune system, or it can reduce the functioning of our immune system and contribute to inflammation. This study was a, a nice collaboration between researchers in Canada and Ireland, which, which recruited 81 women and found that the, a diverse population of bacteria is found within breast tissue, and this diversity is present irrespective of a history of lactation. What they also found was that women with breast cancer have a higher abundance of inflammation-producing bacteria, like the Enterobacteraceae and Staphylococcus, as well as Bacillus species, when compared to women without breast cancer. So interestingly enough, breast tissue has its own microbiome. And if that microbiome largely has these invasive species which contribute to inflammation, as opposed to the healthier bacteria, which include mostly the lactobacillus species, then there's a higher incidence of breast cancer in these women. So we also recommend less meat intake. This is a study that looks at the consumption of red meats, and the incidence of colon cancer in 100,000 women, in different countries per capita daily meat consumption. As you can see, the incidence of colon cancer increases along with meat per capita meat consumption, daily meat consumption. A lot, we also use non-pharmacologic methods such as yoga. Yoga breathing has been found to improve quality of life in patients undergoing cancer treatment, and also improving cancer-related fatigue. These, there are wonderful resources online that can actually coach patients on how to engage accessory respiratory muscles to take deeper, more nourishing, more oxygenating breath every day. This is very important as a very easy technique to learn, and we recommend these types of yoga breathing techniques to almost all of our patients. This is a structure of the thoracic, the, the rib cage, as well as the accessory respiratory muscles that are strengthened by using these yoga techniques. And we also encourage mindfulness. This is a wonderful in, uh, increase in 
mindfulness-related research publications over the years. You can see this exponential rise in research studies that are looking at the benefits of mindfulness and meditation for overall health. Interestingly, real evidence of the mind-body connection has been discovered by these types of research projects that have been done in the University of South Florida that looked at the influence of mindfulness-based stress reduction on telomerase activity in women with breast cancer. This was a randomized controlled trial with 142 breast cancer patients after primary treatment who underwent six weekly two-hour sessions of mindfulness, which included education related to mindfulness, the collective practice of meditation, addressing barriers to regular practice, and using techniques like a body scan, walking meditation, as well as yoga. And what they found was that there was increased telomerase activity in the meditation group. This is real profound evidence of the connection between the body and mind. What happens in the mind impacts the body. What happens in the body impacts the mind. So it behooves us as practitioners to encourage our patients to engage the power of the mind in the healing process. I also would refer you to a wonderful organization called the Society for Integrative Oncology. This, has, this is an international organization which is dedicated to providing evidence-based, real-life, practical solutions for anyone who is living beyond cancer. This is an organization that, com that is comprised of physicians, scientists, researchers, and patients, as well as caregivers from all over the world, all with the dedicated purpose of improving quality of life, living beyond cancer. This is the contact information for our integrative medicine clinic here in South Florida. Thank you all so much for your attention. I really appreciate the invitation to join you all today.